this conversation was meant to be today. Sign number one, French President Emmanuel Macron's address uh, to the European Parliament in Strasbourg, where he condemned the rise of illiberal democracy. He quoted, in the face of authoritarianism, response, our response is not authoritarian democracy, but the authority of democracy. That was sign number one. Sign number two was an open letter to German Chancellor Angela Merkel by a group of journalists and academics and intellectuals. Really a very powerful letter that was the shaming silence of the European People's Party for the lack of focus and attention on Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban's use of anti-Semitism. And it was a very powerful message to say, Europe, politically, you must uh, publicly uh, state that this is not appropriate. And then the third sign, if you have not seen the new online edition of Foreign Affairs, uh, the title is, Is Democracy Dying? A Global Report. And a dear friend of CSIS, Ivan Kreshtov, wrote a pretty impressive article on Eastern Europe's illiberal revolution. If I would have known about it, I would have assigned it to you for reading before this conversation, but I couldn't do that. And he describes in detail what he believes are the reason that illiberalism is rising in Central Europe. So this conversation was meant to be, and we were meant to have this conversation with three uh, incredible colleagues who have joined us today. Let me briefly introduce them and then let's get on our way. To my far right, uh, Radek Sikorsky, uh, who is a distinguished statesman here at CSIS, uh, former foreign minister uh, and defense minister and speaker of the parliament in Poland. Uh, he is now uh, a senior fellow at the Center for of European Studies at Harvard University. Uh, and uh, a, a fellow think tanker and formerly served uh, from 2001 to 2005 as a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. We then have with us David Frum, who is the senior editor at The Atlantic, um, who if you did not read, I also commend to you his April 5th article, uh, which was an interview, The Risks to Freedom in Hungary, which is an interview with uh, Direct 36, one of the last independent uh, news uh, journalists and outlets in Hungary. Um, David, uh, two other outlets have already closed in the last week, so the risks continue to rise in Hungary. Um, uh, prior to uh, his becoming senior editor at The Atlantic, David served as chairman of the Board of Trustees of a Policy Exchange, which is, which is a, a leading think tank in the UK. And formerly, he served as a speechwriter and special assistant to President George W. Bush. And then finally, we have my dear friend, Dr. Charles Gatti, who I like to say everything that I think I know about Central Europe, I learned from Dr. Gatti, a senior research professor of European and Eurasian Studies at uh, Johns Hopkins Seiss, uh, formerly a senior advisor at the policy planning staff at the State Department under the Clinton administration, and uh, former professor at Union College and Columbia University, and author of the must-read, Failed Illusions, Moscow, Washington, Budapest, Budapest, and the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. So we have an all-star lineup on this. So the problem is, how do you get into this subject? And I want to begin by asking all three of you to help us define illiberal democracy. So I'll tell you how this came to be in a speech in 2014 that Prime Minister Viktor Orban gave. And I know, Charles, you have some thoughts on this. So in this speech, Viktor Orban uh, said, a democracy is not necessarily liberal. Just because something is not liberal, it still can be a democracy. He, to maintain global competitiveness, he went on to say, we have to abandon liberal methods and principles of organizing a society. So let me just go down the line here. Roddick, what is illiberal democracy? Is there such a thing? And does it exist in Central Europe today? Well, you can certainly have a democracy in which non-liberals win. Um, but um, to my mind, um, the, um, uh, what populists uh, do um, uh, is distinct from what uh, regular non-liberal Democrats do when they gain power. I would say that populists uh, are different in three respects. Number one, they uh, 
claim to represent not just their part of the electorate, but the entire people uh, metaphysically understood. Um, they also always propose simple solutions to complex problems. And thirdly, they um, always seek enemies, foreign enemies and internal enemies. Uh, their opponents, their uh, competitors for power, are not just uh, competitors. They are always enemies are evil. And in that sense, populists are, by definition, anti-pluralists. And that's what makes it Ill illib illiberal. I also think it's um, necessary to um, have a more sophisticated definition of democracy than just an honest vote on the day. Democracy, surely, is an ecosystem in which competitive politics is possible. Um, whereas if you gain power and then you proceed to purge public institutions to the extent that it's being done. So for example, in Poland, a, a country of 38 million people, about 10,000 uh, civil servants uh, have already been replaced in, in two and a bit years. And major institutions, starting with the Constitutional Tribunal, going through public media, uh, prosecution service, and so on, have been subjugated to party control. Um, then there comes a point where it's actually difficult to, to have a competitive election. David, let me turn to you. What is a liberal democracy? And let me read to you a quote um, uh, that uh, actually um, in this article that Ivan Kristov wrote, he mentioned that uh, the worrying thing about Orban's a liberal democracy, its end cannot be foreseen. A liberal democracy has become the new form of authoritarianism. It is an authoritarianism born within the framework of democracy itself, very much, I think, getting on the lack of ecosystem of competition. Is that what a liberal democracy is, authoritarianism born within the framework of democracy? Um, we are always in danger when we talk about the subject of being distracted by the memory of the most spectacular cases of democratic breakdown in the history of the world, in Italy and in Germany. Um, and in some of the countries of Latin America where there are violent coups. Um, I find it more helpful to think in the modern context of democracy as a dimmer switch rather than a light switch. Not on or off, but brighter or darker. And if we look at American history, we can see um, this process going the other way. Um, Americans think, of, of course, we always think of ourselves as a democratic society. Um, and yet, uh, it is possible to have a functioning democracy as we were while in the 1930s, who are a democracy, while denying the vote to millions of people on the basis of their color. Um, we thought of ourselves as a democracy in the 1950s, even as um, police torture was a routine practice at the state and local level. And we thought of ourselves as a democracy in the 1970s, even though the security services were in no way answerable to the Congress of the United States and answered solely to the executive. Congress didn't even know their budget. Um, in the time since then, each of those things has been to a greater or lesser degree corrected. We have become a more liberal democracy. Well, if it's possible to become a more liberal democracy on the way on, in one direction, in the same way, you can become gradually a less liberal democracy without going through the full overthrow of, of your state. Um, I think as we look at the 21st century, uh, it's important to keep in mind, uh, I keep in mind the words of a great teacher of mine um, who taught medieval history. History never repeats itself. It only appears to do so to those who do not pay attention to the details. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the, fear, the things we have to worry about in the future are not the same as the things we worried about in the past. Excellent. And Charles, I know you're going to say, Victor Orban never even said in a liberal democracy. Help us correct the record here. Well, since the speech to which you referred, uh, he has used the term. But in the original formulation, uh, which was, what, four years ago, uh, when he spoke in a uh, in Transylvanian town, Romania, uh, in Hungarian, uh, he spoke about an illiberal state which uh, Hungary should become, and citing the examples of such illiberal states in his definition as Russia, China, uh, uh, 
actually, interestingly enough, I don't know why, India, Singapore, and one other I forgot. Uh, and he used the term illiberal state. And then his handlers, uh, people who worked for him, realized that uh, this illiberal state in the West, to which Hungary four years ago still paid a little more attention than it does today, then uh, that, that phrase will not work too well, and that Hungary would be uh, criticized an awful lot. So they changed the text, uh, especially in English, uh, right away, and then eventually, to the best of my knowledge, though I'm not sure, in Hungarian as well. But I saw the video. I know what he said, and it was not a democracy. And I agree with him. Uh, I agree with him when he talks about Russia or China. These are not democracies. They may follow certain uh, phrases uh, uh, referring to democracy, or they may have an election uh, uh, that could even be free, more or less free, but probably not very fair, uh, and elections that they win. Uh, but uh, these are not real democracies. I prefer to use the term Western-style democracy. Perhaps it's a cop-out, but I think it tells you something in contrast to the uh, authoritarianism or semi-authoritarianism that has uh, started to grow in Central Europe. One more point, if I may. There are 10 countries uh, in this region, in Central and Eastern Europe, in the European Union. Uh, let's not make a mistake. Some of them remain uh, Western-style democracies. The three Baltic states, even Lithuania, I would put in that category, and certainly Slovenia. One could argue about the Czech Republic. It depends on whether you read uh, Freedom House or The Economist or some other evaluations. But by and large, let's say half of the countries uh, that have been admitted from the region to the European Union continue on a reasonably good path. The others, especially I think Hungary and Poland, do not follow that path, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that in just a moment. Perfect segue. So it's tough to get our arms around the definition, but I think you all uh, gave us some good thoughts about how to focus on illiberalism, state uh, institutions, our understanding of history. So Radek, let me begin with you. Help us understand how Poland has gotten to where it has been, the changes to the constitutional courts, the, the dramatic changes to uh, the government structures. But it seems to me over the last several months, there has been a pause. Uh, pressure from the European Union, perhaps. Uh, pressure from the United States uh, and Israel on a particular piece of legislation, I think that caught all of us uh, by surprise, and I think caught uh, many in the Polish government by surprise. Help us know where it's going and, and what should we watch out for, and positive signs that if they're taking a U-turn from their current direction are perhaps going more boldly into an illiberalism. Well, first of all, um, I don't think, that I agree with Charles that this is not a Central European phenomenon, this is a pan-Western phenomenon, and that's why I'm glad we have David here, because um, um, with his help, I, I hope we can see what works in um, moderating this tendency and what doesn't. And in the United States, of course, uh, you have a constitution which was designed with checks and balances. So um, it, it, here, the chief executive is not an emanation of parliament. He does not own your parliament. Um, uh, uh, whereas in uh, most European systems, to be in power, you need to control uh, parliament. Uh, and so therefore, one check is already absent. Uh, then secondly, you're a much bigger country, and you're a federal country, so you have a, a, a powerful role of the states. We don't have that. Um, and what was done in Poland um, was done before in uh, Hungary, in, in uh, Russia, in uh, Turkey. Um, the first thing you do from that uh, playbook is that you need to control the constitutional tribunal. You make sure that your ordinary legislation has the force of the change of constitution. Because there's no one, if there's no one to, to say 
to say that it isn't, then it passes. Um, uh, and, and then the media are very important. Uh, imagine if NPR here was uh, taken over by, 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 by the team of Breitbart. And you have about the picture of, uh, of, the, of the professionalism and the tone of public media in Poland now. Um, uh, but yes, the United States has spoken up in defense of the uh, uh, largest private television station in Poland, which is owned by the Discovery Organization from this country and happens to be the largest American investment in Poland. And that makes Poland different from Hungary. Because if you have a major uh, independent privately owned television station, then you don't have monopoly of, uh, uh, of information in the public sphere. And that's important. David, your reflections uh, on Hungary or Poland, how do you believe this sort of liberalism, what strikes you, particularly in your conversations with, with journalists and others? Well, um, I won't present myself as any kind of, of expert on the region. I, I very much agree with Ravi about how important it is not to pathologize Central and Eastern Europe. Um, there's a flu going around the neighborhood. Um, some people have got a much worse case than others. Some people have weaker immunities than others, but do understand it's the same flu that we're all uh, getting. And um, in, all of, in all of our countries, uh, it, all of these questions are contested. Um, you know, you look at um, the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, they, they lack the federal system, which is such a robust defender of the strength of, of liberties in the United States. On the other hand, what they do not have at the subnational level, they have at the supranational level, that every one of these countries has to be aware. I, I don't know if this is still true, but I remember looking it up in 2016, that at that time, the flow of EU funds into Hungary was relative to, to the Hungarian economy equivalent to the defense budget of the United States in terms of the American economy. It was not an amount of money to sneeze at. Um, uh, in all, but in all these places, um, as the memories of the war fade, as the idealistic component of what was done in the 1950s and 60s and 70s is relegated to history, rather than being a live project to prevent um, a recurrence of experiences that people had had, um, uh, we discover that work that was, we thought was once done has to be done anew. And let me point again to an American example as a way of depathologizing Eastern Europe. Um, the, United, the, the role of the security services in the United States has always been kind of a, a questionable one. Uh, the FBI operated with almost total impunity uh, um, from the political branches through mo it, most of its first half century of existence. Um, it reported sort of to the president, not at all to Congress. Um, since the middle 1970s, uh, the FBI has reported more and more to both president and Congress. Um, but the exact relationship of the FBI to the, to the presidency remains uncertain. Um, and that question, does, do the security services work for the state in general or for the president in particular? We are contesting that right now. We have had two cases in American history where the FBI director was fired. Once it happened under Bill Clinton, now again under Donald Trump, who fired also an acting director, two FBI directors really. Um, when Bill Clinton fired an FBI director in 1993, he did so at, on the basis of a widely agreed s statement of facts of a problem, a misuse of official accounts. Um, he, the head of the FBI was given an op was notice of his offenses and an opportunity to comment. There was consultation with Congress. Um, and after uh, Congress agreed with the president that the accounts had been misused, and after some weeks of controversy, the FBI director was fired, and the message was sent to the FBI director, although theoretically serving at the pleasure of the president, in fact serves not at the pleasure of the president. Um, we are now contesting that. Donald Trump is asserting that the FBI director can be fired at any time for any reason with no consultation. Um, if he succeeds politically, that will be the new rule. And the FBI, that all the changes that have been made to the FBI since the middle 1970s will be undone. Um, and not only undone, but more than undone, because it, at least under J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI was itself a form of check and balance. And it, as, as a mock as it ran, it certainly didn't answer to the, political, to the president. Um, if Donald Trump prevails, it will. Um, and this is, the kind of, th this is the kind of problem that I'm sure can be replicated in the United Kingdom, uh, in France, in the Netherlands, and other places, as well as in Eastern Europe. Charles, help us understand how this has manifested itself in Hungary, uh, now with uh, Prime Minister Orban re-elected uh, resoundingly uh, with a uh, 
very strong supermajority in the Hungarian parliament. Um, what do you, how do you believe the future will go? We're now seeing uh, more independent uh, media outlets um, close business, NGOs, civil society is, is feeling an enormous amount of pressure. Help us understand what this looks like in Hungary, and, and you can feel free to go beyond that to Central Europe or even throughout Europe. Well, <coughs> I would start out uh, by referring to an article you and I wrote. Okay. 11 years ago. We're very ago. biased about this article. Inter International Herald Tribune, I think it was called at that time, in April of 2007. And in the subtitle, uh, it was primarily about Poland, not about Hungary, but the, we used the word for the editor who gave it the title, backsliding. Uh, and in the invitation to this gathering here, you use that, or somebody used the word backsliding. Well, when it comes to Hungary and Poland, uh, and probably Bulgaria, uh, I don't like that word anymore. I think we should understand they are not backsliding democracies. They are either authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regimes that maintain the facade of democratic uh, uh, processes. So that's the first thing that I, I want to say. The second one is that uh, 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 for the, the, um, an American audience to understand uh, what happened in the elections in Hungary to which you refer, 70% uh, of the vote, give and take uh, a percent, 70% went to two right-wing or far-right parties. One is Fidesz, Orban's party, and the other is Jobbik which is no longer to the right of Fidesz, but somewhere in the same uh, neighborhood, maybe even on some issues towards the center. 70%, but that has led to 80% of the seats in parliament. Now, if uh, you want to understand what this means, consider an election in the United States in which uh, the Freedom Forum or the Tea Party gets 80% of the seats in the US Congress, both houses, with the right to uh, nominate or elect members of the Supreme Court, with the right to nominate or elect the prime minister of their choosing, uh, and, every, and also uh, pass laws that further restrict freedom of the press. That's roughly what it is. What else can we add to that? I have to have provide some good news here, because otherwise people will be leaving, crying their heads off. You know, the world is coming to an end. Well, the world is not coming to an end. It's not so good, but it's not coming to an end. Consider that despite these in, in incredible results, uh, the capital city of Budapest, where every fifth Hungarian lives, two million of the 10 million, uh, the opposition carried Budapest by two-thirds of the vote. In other words, what you have is what you have in Poland and, and what you have in France, what you have in England, and what you have in the United States, a tremendous difference between large cities yeah. and the countryside. Now, this is not as marked in Poland by now, but certainly in the previous election at the time you and I wrote uh, our article, was very much the case. So these are the two critical points about Hungary. What do I see in the future? What I see is that in the absence of, and we'll come to that, of uh, international uh, pressure, I believe that Mr. Orban's rule will continue because the opposition is weak, divided. It does not have enough money. It does not have access to a press, especially in the countryside, because in the city, people have computers, and, on the, and the internet is more or less free. In fact, I would say it is free. Uh, 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 let's just be clear about that. Uh, as it is in Poland, too, by the way. So uh, people who are already interested in the cities to find out what's going on, they can. Well, and I, I know, Rock, you want to uh, jump in a bit on those comments, but, but let me drill down a little deeper. So what is driving some of this? And is it a, it is a, it is a pan-advanced uh, democracy phenomenon, but I, but I want to I hone in on Poland and Hungary, because I think they're just a, a laboratory, an early adopter of some of these techniques. The economy, the economy is going like gangbusters in Poland and Hungary. So is it inequality? Is it the urban-rural divide? 
Is it a, a sense of historic grievance? We have both in Hungary and Poland a re-visualization, if you will, of their own national histories. We hear more about Trianon in Hungary. We hear about those grievances. Poland is revisiting much of its, of its past, both solidarity, its immediate past, and that legacy, as well as even going back farther and thinking through its own identity. Is it about corruption in Hungary? No, that's a less of an issue uh, in Poland. Uh, but, but clearly, weakened opposition and then policies and structures that purposefully reduce and weaken that opposition, that's really, for me, a hallmark of this trend towards a liberalism. So I'd welcome if you could weave some sure. of those uh, issues. And then just demonstration. On Saturday, we saw tens of thousands in Hungary. We've seen where Poland, demonstrations do tend to give the government a little bit of a, of a pause. Um, you know, David, we've seen some demonstrations here as well. If you want to reflect on the U.S. there and other locations, help us understand the people power in all of this equation as well. People power has to um, uh, be reflected in the polls or it's, um, or it's ineffective politically. Uh, but in order to win a, a, a fair election, which Poland uh, certainly was, in which the current ruling party got a fair 38% of the vote, 41% of seats in parliament, and they certainly have the right to rule. They don't have the right to change the system, uh, which is where they are overstepping. Um, but in order to win, populists first need to focus on something that's popular. Uh, and they did. Um, they focused on uh, an issue which um, was at the height of uh, atten public attention in all of Europe, namely migration. And um, uh, you might argue why this was, you might wonder why this was an issue in the most ethnically homogeneous country in Europe, Poland. But uh, under Europe's uh, Schengen system, whoever comes into any one European country can settle, uh, can travel anywhere else. So the argument was uh, made, and it was uh, credible, that if a million refugees uh, from the Middle East and Northern Africa come into Europe because Europe has lost control over the perimeter, that is potentially an unwelcome development uh, for Poland. And in Poland, it has a... a, a uh, however unpopular, how, however politically incorrect this may sound, it has a religious tinge. Poles have no problem with migrants from uh, Christian countries. They have a problem. They think it's, um, uh, it's more difficult to integrate Muslims and Muslim communities. They think that the process has failed in Germany and France, whatever you might think about that, number one. Number two, uh, populists correctly identified an, an issue, which is to say that uh, Poland's fantastic economic growth, the most successful economic um, catch-up in a thousand years, 27 years without a, a single year's recession, uh, catching up from 35% GDP per capita in 89 by comparison with Western Europe to almost 70% today. But the GDP figures reflect the activity of the economy, not wages. And wages have lagged. And uh, uh, credit where credit is due, uh, very generous social uh, policies have now been proposed and enacted to uh, redress the balance. And thirdly, cultural issues, very powerful cultural issues. Uh, just like in the United States, in Poland, religiosity is dropping rapidly. And it's the despair of an endangered majority over a way of life and a way of, um, a, 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 and a culture, very deep, very traditional, and uh, with a lot of history behind it, uh, being in danger. Um, uh, the ruling party of Poland has just had its, its, its uh, conference, and the biggest applause for uh, um, Chairman Kaczynski was when he said, uh, as long as we're in charge, we will never allow gay marriage, and the other lot will. Mm. Cultural issues. Um, but I would like to say if just a few words on what David mentioned, because I, I think this is widely misunderstood, both in Poland, in Europe, and in particular in the United States, the issue of EU um, funds and EU's instruments of, of affecting events. 
In Poland's case, it's also huge. Most Americans have no idea. It's about net of Poland's contribution. Um, it's about a billion euros per month. And it's been so for a decade. So this is Poland's chance to catch up infrastructurally. Uh, this is th these are the funds from which we've built our highways, our, uh, our modern infrastructure, trained people, um, built cultural centers, and so on. Plus, agricultural funds. The only group in Poland which has a guaranteed European level income are Polish farmers. But first of all, these are all guaranteed in the current multi-annual budget until 2020. And they are, it, it, it's all deeply ingrained in treaties. And secondly, um, remember, the European Union is not a federal state. Brussels cannot tell a state, uh, uh, you've broken the law, therefore we're withholding your money. Uh, the European Union is a confederation in which member states do peer review. The European Commission is the civil service answerable to the European Council at which member states are either equal or vote in proportion to their population. And therefore, what you can do will most likely affect only the future budget after 2020 and would punish the Polish people for uh, transgressions by the current uh, government, and very few people would want that. Now, the EU has a real dilemma because it is based, the, the, the whole confederation is based on the idea of mutual trust among the institutions. So, for example, courts have to trust one another because only if you trust one another can you have a, a European arrest warrant courts in one country respecting an arrest warrant issued uh, in another country. Only when you have mutual trust can you have Schengen, consuls of one country issuing a visa that allows you to travel all over Europe. And it's, it's, it's subtle, but if this mechanism of trust is broken, then the consequences are very profound for the whole union. It really gets to the cohesion of the EU should it go forward. But EU instruments, and we're going to get back to the tools, Article 7 and the Lisbon Treaty have not been effective because Hungary and Poland are working Poland together participated to block in, in, uh, in drafting the uh, details of how the Article 7 of the Lisbon Treaty should be applied. And we, I never, when I participated in the discussions, you didn't think this in my worst true. nightmares, <laughs> I didn't think that it would apply to my, to my country. Um, uh, but, um, you know, uh, uh, sanctions have always been used by authoritarian regimes around the world uh, to mobilize their supporters against foreign enemies. Take Cuba, take Iran, take Venezuela, take North Korea, and there are many uh, less dramatic examples. Um, and sanctions, we now know, only work in the very long run. Uh, and, there are, and, and so, uh, I would caution against, uh, against uh, uh, sanctions if, if all they are um, uh, going to do is to uh, give a sense of uh, satisfaction that uh, something has been done. Because that something can be very counterproductive. Absolutely. David, help us reflect. Um, well, the loss of confidence in Hungarian arrest warrants may explain how it was that the President of the United States had a senior staffer with an open Hungarian arrest warrant um, <laughs> for him uh, who served in the White House for more than a year, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, who had, was uh, not only on an arrest warrant, but an arrest warrant pertaining to a gun crime, which normally would be something you'd be a little sensitive about in the White House, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, we've lost confidence, so, uh, so he was allowed to serve, or maybe there's some other explanation. I'm not sure he was or is a Hungarian citizen. <laughs> uh, but, um, I, I want to take up two points about yep. these instrumentalities. Um, uh, the first is people power, and the second about, about sanctions. Um, I, I think w we will discover that people power has enormous potential um, in the 21st century. There are two, two things that are 
define state power um, for all of us. Authoritarian state, uh, democratic state, semi-authoritarian, authoritarian, um, all, any state that is connected to the world economy. And that is that never have states deployed so much surveillance technology hmm. as they have today, and never have they been subject to so many, such strong inhibitions against the use of violence as today. I mean, even a monster like Vladimir Putin, his total lifetime t uh, tally for murder would not, Stalin would not think he had earned lunch if, 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 he, if he had a record like Putin's. And everywhere else, I mean, in the Chinese state, I mean, they, yes, they use violence, but again, but the, their victims number in the single thousands um, since, uh, since 1990. Um, in the European countries, violence is, is really, I mean, even in, in Hungary, it's, it's unthinkable. It's unthinkable that, that Viktor Orban would, would count this a, a beating, much less a, a, a killing of a political opponent. Um, so, uh, and that is something I think that everybody senses. It gives populations, they know the ability of the state in the age of um, smartphones, instant video, and the interconnection of states one to another, and the dependence on flows of funds, both public and private across lines. Violence has never been less a tool of the state than today. The surveillance, never more powerful uh, than today. And that is something that up to the moment where the people decide to come into the streets, everybody has to has to reckon with. I want to say something about, about sanctions. The most powerful sanctions have never been those that are imposed by states. They are those that are imposed by private or entities. A country loses the confidence of international markets, um, and that is the sanction. It can't sell its debt. It can't attract investment. But there, there also has to be a caveat that um, some states are much more sensitive to these kinds of sanctions than others. The extreme case is South Africa. Um, a, a state that was characterized by being actually quite a poor country um, on average. Uh, pre apartheid South Africa, the, I mean, the, a small number of people lived middle class lives, but most people were very poor, a, that earned its living with hugely capital intensive industries that required massive flows of international front funds in order to be competitive. Um, so that's your pure case. Of but it took, what, 15 years? Yeah, but it was, it, I'm not talking about the formal sanctions, I'm talking about the capital strike that hit South Africa a after the middle 1980s, as the future became more and more uncertain. And that, um, the, the unwillingness to invest in gold mines and diamond mines, that's what brought the regime down, not the things that the government's imposed. And when you're trying to assess how vulnerable is, um, is a country to such pressures, that's the, the richer it is, the less vulnerable, and the less capital intensive um, its economy is, the less vulnerable. Charles, let me have you uh, chime in here, and then I'm going to do a quick round on policy tools and sharpening sanctions and that question and other tools. But let me have you jump in here and lots to, t lots to reflect on. Well, I'm in general agreement uh, uh, with uh, David and, uh, and Ruddick. Uh, uh, I would just say three things. One is the demonstrations, uh, which we have seen in several countries, including last Saturday, about 100,000 people in, in Budapest, uh, uh, which was quite remarkable. They serve different purposes under different circumstances. You were right in suggesting, or somebody did, that I, I cannot imagine that this Hungarian government can be brought down by demonstrations, nor should it. There are still elections, and therefore it should be defeated, if it is to be defeated, uh, uh, at the polls. And I think it's possible that next year, when there are municipal elections, that Budapest will go to the opposition. That remains to be seen. It's a little early uh, uh, to say. On the other hand, there are other countries where the demonstrations serve a direct uh, or, or result in direct uh, political consequences. Slovakia is the I best example so. where Fico had to resign. And he's gone. Now, it is true that his replacement is, is, is a small Fico. Uh, uh, but uh, still, it's a very substantial change, and we don't know yet. We are in the middle of it. We'll see uh, where it leads to. So, uh, so I am really, uh, I, I usually have very strong opinions, but on demonstrations, you really have to uh, see each case independently. A second brief point, just to add to others, the EU is impotent on political change in Poland or in Hungary. Uh, the figures are comparable uh, in Hungary. The one billion you're saying 
uh, per month. Well, I don't have the figure with me. You know, Hungary is one fourth of Poland. Uh, it's perfectly possible that, uh, that the Hungarian economy, or I should say Hungarian corrupt leaders, have benefited from EU funds as much, relatively speaking, or, uh, as, as, as Poland. It hasn't made a difference, nor do I expect them to bring their act together. An interesting and thirdly possibility is what, it, and especially because I'm looking here for Ambassador Verschbau sitting right here, uh, uh, and, I, uh, and I, I'm reluctant to say anything about NATO in his presence, but I will <laughs> um, anyway. You know, uh, in the 1990s, uh, at a time when I also worked at the State Department, we looked at NATO enlargement as a way of shaming the European Union into enlargement, and that worked very well. Unfortunately, it cannot be done the other way around. You cannot kick out, nor should you, Poland, or even Turkey, because they're important. But there are countries uh, in, in NATO that make little or no contribution at all, financial or otherwise, and some step, uh, uh, perhaps suspending their voting rights, would be ideal, except that the NATO Charter does not provide for any of this. Now, my personal belief is that if we had a U.S. leadership and we didn't have this guy in the White House, uh, how he got there is, is beyond me. Uh, but no, I, I, watch, I watch David on uh, MSNBC a lot and try to figure it out. But if we had uh, a, a normal uh, a U.S. leadership with some interest in Central Eastern Europe, I think they would figure out a way to use NATO as an instrument of American and indeed Western power to put some pressure to kick, kick out countries. I'm not quite talking about that, but certainly there are intermediate steps that could be made. I don't expect it to happen as long as uh, uh, we have this, this president in the White House. I never want to disagree with you, and I want to open up the, uh, to questions, and Radek, I'll let you chime in when we pull up a couple questions. Uh, President Trump went to Warsaw in July. He just met last week with the three Baltic states. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is a, a disinterest by the president, but a disinterest in the issues that we're talking about. Right. So I just That's a, a slight uh, nuance there. All right, we're going to unleash the Can audience. I just on, on yep, sure, sure. And then I want to talk about, at the end, policy tools. Yes, Radek. Charles, I disagree. Uh, NATO is a defensive alliance. In foreign policy, if you try to use an instrument for that for which it wasn't designed, you're in danger of breaking the instrument. I don't think NATO is fit for this. I think the sanction that unfortunately we, we Central Europeans uh, are imposing on ourselves with this slide away from democratic standards is that we have reawakened um, stereotypes about the region that were on the way to being buried. And we have contributed to the decline in the um, willingness of Western Europe to consider further Eastern enlargement. You see, Central Europe would be truly secure and more prosperous if it became like Western Europe if it had normal Western uh, uh, neighbors in the East. And this was being considered. You know, when I negotiated with uh, um, Foreign Minister uh, Steinmeier in the, 10 years ago, he said, Ukrainian membership around 2020, conceivable. Today, it is not conceivable, or even starting the process because of what happened in Ukraine, but also because the appetite for enlargement, for importing more trouble into, as, as is seen in uh, Western Europe, has diminished. And that's the real sanction. Okay, I'm going to take some questions and you can, then you can reply, because we've got to get our audience in. These, you, guys, you should have seen these guys in the back room. I couldn't get them stopped. So, okay, here we go. Um, so what I'd love is uh, for you to introduce yourself, uh, ask a question, if it's to a particular panelist, Please, but we'll let everyone respond. So I see right down the middle here, Max. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yes, uh, Obrad Kasich, and I have uh, two questions. One is uh, for uh, Radek uh, Sikorsky. 
Uh, when you began your presentation, uh, you defined three characteristics of uh, illiberal populism or populist uh, states. And I'm having difficulty differentiate your how to classify liberal democracies because if we take each one of those, we <coughs> see that over the last 20 years, there are elements that fit even Western liberal democracy, especially the last one about finding enemies because it seems like we're constantly fighting a war and we're constantly bombing. And I'm trying to figure out how do you differentiate between what makes an illiberal or populist uh, regime and the elements that fit for liberal Western democracies uh, in your definition. Uh, for David Fromm, I have to say I'm very troubled by this notion that the FBI is a balance of itself on the three uh, branches of our government under the Constitution. I'm having very difficult wrapping my mind around what you said earlier in the sense of what role the FBI or security services should play and I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more in terms of how you see that fitting in with the Constitution. Thank you. And Ambassador, yes please. Thank you. My name is Karnula Stotter. I'm the Swedish ambassador uh, here in the U.S. And Charles, we met many times in Hungary. And I oh, hope nice to invite to you, you for lunch again. And David, we actually met uh, when I was deputy here before. But my question is to you, Radek. Um, we always talk about in Europe, so what does it take to actually punish countries like Hungary and, and, and Poland to get them more into line when, with our values, etc.? And uh, in my country, we are, of course, extremely upset by the migration policy in, in Hungary, which we think is deeply unfair to, to those of us who actually uh, do take our part here. But, and I know that European politicians are very reluctant to, of course, go after another member state. But what do you think, what development do we need to see? How, how far do these countries have to go for, for the Western European or more fun <coughs> the founders of the Union to actually uh, react, and I saw this already happening when I was ambassador to Hungary, you know, eight years ago. It from which country, sorry? Uh, from my country, Sweden, but also from the founders, like France and Belgium, and those countries. It's, it's very, I think, hard and difficult for them to, to take measures to actually punish another member state. What do you think it would take? And I'm going to take one more question. Yes, sir, right there, please. And then we'll let everyone jump in quickly. Thank you. Uh, Chris Marshagi from Albright Stonebridge Group. I was in Budapest last week during election night in the streets um, with uh, a bunch of young voters. And uh, beyond frustration with the results, I think there was a bewilderment uh, because you have a system in which only 49% of voters voted for <coughs> Orban, but he's getting 68% of the seats. Uh, and so you have a majority of Hungarians that actually voted against uh, Viktor Orban. So the question for them is, is how do they change the electoral system from the outside and can Orban leave democratically? And what can Western states, Brussels and, and Washington do to, to change that? Thanks. Perfect, Sorry, great questions, thank you. Radek, I'll start with you because you had some directed, but then I want David and Charles to, to jump in and just be a little mindful of the time. We have about eight or nine minutes. It, it's a genuine dilemma because um, uh, I think the word punishment shouldn't be used, first of all. S uh, secondly, because we are, we are a family of friends, the European Union. And as uh, friends and allies, we, are, uh, re we have referred some matters to uh, institutions um, that, uh, that have our trust, like the Council of Europe and the Venice Commission, which specializes in the uh, 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 judging the constitutionality and, uh, uh, and, and, and democratic nature of state systems. Uh, and the Venice Commission has um, um, proposed recommendations. And let's just hope that these recommendations will be uh, seriously considered and, uh, and enacted. Because once you start talking in terms of punishments and sanctions, uh, you are on a very slippery slope. Um, um, and you have to think about what the political effect will be. And I'm, I'm a great fan of an Indian um, pro proverb. If you can't be a lion, don't be a mosquito. <laughs> right? 
And the European Union doesn't have the powers of a lion. We only have the power of, of peer review. Uh, um, and, and, and therefore, I think it's in the end, uh, the, the shape of democracy, it's, it's for, um, in Poland's case, the Polish people to, uh, um, to resolve. Um, uh, you know, I tell my Western friends, um, uh, we have experience with fighting for democracy, you know. <laughs> We've done this sort of thing before. Uh, uh, and uh, it then has to work in our, uh, in our terms. Um, and, and the commentary should be that of concerned friends, the tone. As regards um, enemies, fair comment. Uh, I would argue to you that, yes, liberal democracies also have enemies, but they are real ones. You know, uh, you may uh, agree or disagree with the Iraq war, but it was provoked by a, 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 an actual terrorist attack. And there are actually people out there who uh, wish to murder our citizens. Whereas populists invent enemies. You know, it is true that Al-Qaeda struck the United States. It is not true that an international Jewish conspiracy with George Soros as, at its head is trying to bring down um, Hungary. Um, populists always um, use conspiracy theories. So in Hungary, it's, it's Soros. In Poland, it's the um, Smolensk assassination. Uh, there is no evidence for it, but it doesn't stop uh, uh, a lot of people believing it. And I think that's the difference. David. Um, it's an FBI matter. Um, in one of George Orwell's essays from the 1930s, he describes what was a popular music hall song in England at the time. And the chorus was, you can't do that here. You can't do that here. Maybe you can do that somewhere else, but you can't do that here. I think that is the essence of the liberal democratic spirit. Um, and one of the things that defines the United States is because we are governed by this ancient constitution, core working parts from 1787, a lot of questions that are completely unanticipated um, in the 1787 document that we deal with informally with an understanding on the principle you can't do that here. So when we began to ha need the kind, uh, when the United States became a great power, when the world became smaller, when it had to build institutions like the CIA and the FBI, um, and the question is, well, how do you how do you govern them? I mean, and we have governed them at first not very well, later better, through an un informal understanding, which is they're part of the executive branch. They take orders from the president. But Congress has oversight. And the in oversight is often very informal, um, not just through the, the intelligence committees created in the 1970s, but through the kind of consultation Bill Clinton did when he fired his FBI. He didn't take it to a committee of Congress, because it's, it's, he's a presidential appointee. But he, he made sure that relevant congressional members saw the evidence, agreed that it was compelling before he you know, fired someone. He did not assert the right to have the person serve at his pleasure. Um, so, but the status of these institutions has, um, has always been a question mark. Now, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not <coughs> claiming, and I hope I didn't say anything to suggest that I see them as some kind of branch of government, um, but I see their status within the government as an extremely important problem, and the Trump administration has forced us truly to confront that problem, because pre one of President Trump's ambitions is to neutralize the um, independence of those agencies, to use them as instrumentalities of his personal power. And I think to, Americans have to say about that, you can't do that here. Maybe you can do that somewhere else, but you can't do that here. One thing about, about punishments, and I just don't, that's not my topic, but um, I don't think that's how we're going to get out of this. Uh, in January of 1941, Anne Morrow Lindbergh, the wife of the great aviator, Charles Lindbergh, the famous Nazi sympathizer, published a book called The Wave of the Future, in which she said, in a tone full of regret, that the day for the United States and for France and England, that was over, and that the future belonged to the strong totalitarian regimes like France, like, like Germany, Italy, and the Soviet Union. So four years later, Hamburg is a foot and a half high, um, and it ain't the wave of the future anymore. And Democracy, the democratic idea was so strong because it was, um, it was not only a guarantee of the dignity of the human being, but also the security and of the prosperity. This was an exciting concept, and people wanted to adhere to it. 
Uh, that's very much the mood in Central and Eastern Europe after 1990. At last, a chance to join and become a modern country. So the unsuccess of uh, the Western world since the later 1990s, the comparative unsuccess, um, has d removed a lot of the prestige of this idea. I think the most powerful thing we can do, and the, thing that, the way this problem, in my opinion, actually in the real world will be solved, is when we do things in the United States and elsewhere to bring, renew the prestige of this idea and make the world want to follow again the way it did in 1990. Charles, I'm going to give you the benediction, the last word. Mm -hmm. I know. After David's it's inspiring quite, message, that's hard. Quite a responsibility it here. <laughs> but the, the question was fairly uh, narrow about the Hungarian uh, electoral uh, law. Uh, when you have a two-thirds majority, and uh, Orban's party, Fidesz, has a two-thirds majority now, uh, you can change the constitution as you wish. I'd like to emphasize that Fidesz is not much of a political party. It has one leader who I think by his standards is a brilliant politician, uh, started out as one and uh, has grown into the job. And I believe that uh, he, with the help of that super majority, uh, will further uh, degrade <coughs> the electoral system. Gerrymandering can continue. Well, it is done, unfortunately, everywhere in the world. What was unusual about the uh, initial change introduced a few years ago that has assured Fidesz's uh, victory and will continue to assure it is ending, uh, in effect, ending the, the two-party uh, uh, possibility. You're shaking your head. You're very familiar with it. But for the sake of others, let me just say that Hungary, like other European uh, countries had a multi-party democracy, but it had uh, uh, two rounds in the elections. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, the two winners, in effect, ended up in the second round uh, facing each other. So the opposition had a chance, the opposition to a, a dominant party, used to be the socialists, by the way, social democrats, and then now it has been Fidesz. The opposition had a chance to recover and uh, support one opposition candidate. This is no longer possible because with a brilliant political move, I say brilliant perhaps in quotation marks, uh, uh, they ended the system. And so there is one round. Uh, and the opposition uh, 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 finds it very, very difficult to, uh, to get behind uh, uh, one candidate. So therefore, uh, it's very difficult for me to imagine that uh, 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 how uh, Fidesz can be defeated in you know, four years' time. But let me emphasize also, nor can it be defeated from abroad. We can complain about the European Union not doing this or that, as I do, but it should not be done by the European Union. It should not be done by NATO or the United States. I think what we can do is more or less <coughs> an, an important spiritual uh, task, which is to, uh, to, uh, to steal a phrase from somebody you all know very well, and that is to keep hope alive. I believe this is the job for the United States. Our uh, present embassy is doing a very good job at it, by the way, uh, in, in Budapest. I don't know how it's doing in Poland, probably not quite as well. Uh, and and uh, it has to be decided by Hungarians in Hungary, and I think the Budapest election next year gives us some hope that, uh, that things will, uh, uh, will not go in, the, in a bad direction forever. Well, I want to thank you three so much. We could have spent and should have spent hours diving into this. It's not just a reflection of Central Europe or Europe. It's our own reflection. David, thank you for giving us those insights. I loved your, uh, your thought about this is a flu. So here's my little take on it's a rule flu. We are, we are seeing changes in the rules to support super majorities, cultural, to change those rules, but we have to return to keeping hope alive and the dignity of the individual. And I think that starts with each and every one of us. So that's the, uh, that is our words of encouragement as we go forth today. Keep democratic hope alive. Please join me in thanking our Thank three you. guests for a great conversation. <laughs>